going to call the meeting to order at 9 a.m. Eric, I believe a roll call for us, please. We have Tom Green. Present. Arlene Zorman. Here. Josh Stransky. Here. Glenn Pepper. Here. Uh, Jeff Hayes. Here. Jeff Hayes. Here. Jeff Hayes. Here. Jeff Hayes. Here. And Teresa. Here. Glenn, you hear us okay, right? Oh, we are muted. Glenn, we just did roll call, but we just realized we were muted. Can you hear us okay now? Oh, I'm on 100. That's the best we got. All right, let's go to item number two, approval of the minutes from our October 10th, 2023 meeting. Do I have a motion? Second. I have a motion to approve and second for the minutes. Any discussion on this? All right, let's vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? All right, motion passes. Number three, public invited to be heard. Anybody from the public? You're here. <laughs> I take that as no. All right, number four, organizational updates. A, Operations Retreat Draft Agenda. All right, I'm going to take lead on this one. So uh, we are planning on holding an Operations Retreat on Thursday, this Thursday. Um, we kind of, between the main groups that are here plus the HCB, the voucher team, there are really, as we get very settled in with LHA and how we're, how we're going to operate from going forward rather than working backwards and, and fixing old things. Um, we know that there are needs that we have that we cannot yet afford in terms of staffing, but we are working on getting there. So um, one of the items that really is crosses all of the groups, property operations, finance, voucher, which tying to compliance is uh, kind of things in that asset management realm where we've got special projects that don't really fit with anyone in particular. We all have to chip in, which means a ton of coordination. Um, and then also uh, we're just getting absolutely slammed with compliance because a number of things. Coming out of COVID, all of the agencies are monitoring. They're coming back to monitor after taking a hiatus. And because we have now, the city has been involved with LHA for a couple of years, they want to see what we've done. So we have so many monitorings and inspections all the time. And so we've been really working as a team to figure out how to make sure nothing falls through the cracks when we have a lot of hands in the pot. And so um, both with planning out our needs for future staffing, which one is um, the board did agree to budget for an assistant director position that kind of would be on the operations side and help tie all the pieces together. Um, so that is, we're writing that job description now. But in the meantime, we do need to, we want to make sure all those teams are threading together um, on any issue and making sure nothing falls through the cracks. Um, so that's where this operations retreat was born out of and so all those groups will be coming together on Thursday and we just wanted to uh, give you all the opportunity to see what we are planning to talk about and give us any advice or suggestions for what we could um, include it really was the, the point really is to problem solve together with groups that may not see each other all the time um, and make sure that everyone's on the same page with processes that we've put into place in the last two years. Some of it's new. Um, just really make sure we are on solid ground and then bring in that operations role and uh, really help tie the middle on top and have everybody uh, solid with what they're doing. So um, the draft agenda is in your packet. Uh, the first item is uh, we're going to roll out a community management manual that this team has been working on for a very long time. Um, we don't have the draft here today. It's in final editing with our, our admin staff right now, and also it's huge. Um, but Lisa, do you want to kind of give a little bit of a brief introduction to what we want to do with that, how we want to use it, why we want to use it as our kickoff? I just 
such as our manual, so it's going to be basically like our protocol. So each vendor has the same stuff going forward, same timeline, same kind of policies, procedures, how to treat certain situations. Because right now, I think for the last few years, as we've kind of all all new, all coming into this crazy LHA world, kind of just flew by the seat of our pants and made stuff as we went, policies as we went. And so this is combining it all into one document. Future staff will have it, current staff, so everybody's on the same page. Kendra, we want to give a little brief intro to what you want to go over with property budget management. Um, so the property, so what we've kind of been hearing from property managers is that they were not doing what they normally did in other entities as being property manager, which is like actually being part of the budget process, being part of, um, we just implemented um, the invoices. They are also making the invoices so they get to see the costs that are coming in um, and approve those and see exactly what maintenance is spending and stuff like that. So what I want to propose is like, how do you want to do that? Because I do want to bring them into the budget process and, and how we work that through and where each property would need to start. The part store and lot is going to have to start with a lot sooner in the property um, and bring the maintenance needs and all of that and just kind of workshop like what they've done before and what they'd like to see in the village. And it's kind of an empowering thing to give them some control of their budgets so they can make decisions uh, with, with guidance, but just uh, have a little bit more ownership, take ownership of what's going on on site. Yeah, part of that two sigma historically was the budgets were so out of control when we, when we took over that we had to take complete control of them and really stabilize them and get them set up in a way and get some experience under our belt to understand how it was really working. And now we're starting to loosen up in that world because uh, the first budget we got, everything was budgeted in the red. And, uh, and people didn't know where they were spending, what they were spending. It was, it was, it was an interesting kind of experience taking it over, I think. Now, I mean, we're where we need to be, I think we understand it. And so now it's letting it go. They like with that here. They're, they're able to monitor it as well. And they get the budget reports, I'm assuming. Yes, we've showed them how to pull up their budgets, um, how to drill down. And uh, now that they, part, of the, part of the problem is they didn't really know because the maintenance team they need something right away to purchase it so they can never see what was coming out on the purchase. Um, <clears throat> we also have the nice tool in the system where they can put a unit assignment. So we can start to see like, oh, so the refrigerator, when was the refrigerator replaced in this unit? You know, and, and that technique, which we didn't have that as a nice feature <laughs> before. It was kind of just in the notes so you have to start pushing. That's that's the that's the yeah, that's within yarding. Yeah, that's within yarding. Um, the property managers have up to $250 that they get approved. So they'll see an invoice, they'll approve it. Anything above and beyond $250 will go to the regional property manager. Anything above $25,000 will go to Molly. Anything above $100 will go to your own. So there is a, there's a process. And it'll, it'll actually strengthen our separation of duties with our auditors so we can show that who all approved what at what stage. How do you guys handle uh, performance assessments with the property managers? Do you have annual performance assessments, semi annual? You'll, you'll see you're that's, 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 our that. next, <laughs> that's our next thing on our agenda. Speaking of Lisa, do you have a copy of Deb's example? Did we put that in here? Or do we have it? If you want to send it, oh. I, I could just pull it up on here when we get to that. Um, then lunch, most important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then um, coming back, we're going to go over some operations goal setting. So we have LHA board goals that have been set and we report on annually. They are much more big picture. Um, and we want to let the uh, teams that all work in the day-to-day -to, -day to be able to set some goals for themselves too under the umbrella of the overall board goals. Um, so we're going to try and do a session there to draw out some ideas and again it's all about taking ownership and pride in your work um 
Tracy's going to go over some compliance stuff. She's going to do a review of the findings and things that we've seen that all of these monitors have been looking for over the past year. Kind of do a summary, a recap, and, and prepare for the future um, when you see the trends coming. And then also just reiterate processes and make sure we talk about ideas for their processes because this is where every single group is involved and it is very easy for something to fall through the cracks if we don't have a solid process to make sure everybody knows what they're supposed to do with prep. Um, the performance modeling. So, <coughs> Lisa, have you been able to see you guys? Yes. I'm gonna just bear with me for a moment while I fill it up. money we made. So we've really been pushing that with them. And as you can see in quarter one, the, the term days have gotten a little bit better. They started to Sorry, it's pretty yeah, small. 91, it's 91 days was the um, average for quarter one for a uh, unit term, which should be 10 days is our policy. Um, so, and I did not count F units in this quarter. So this is for the suite, so we had a couple of units. So I did not even count those. Um, so we're a difficult group about with whole orders and all that. So we're trying to get this to improve into 2024, but this is just like I said, the data for this past year up to the current date. So Deb Police works in our um, HCI office at the city and she's working on the city side of things, but she came from Loveland Housing Authority and she was involved in um, uh, voucher program and, and the property side as well. And she brought this with her. This is something that she used to help the teams take ownership of the work, see their own performance, um, and use it for, in, in their case, they, they use it for incentive um, as well, which is something that we would consider down the road once we have uh, something set up or have budget authority to do so. But um, it is really something that that everyone can see. So everyone's on the same page. Everyone can see how the properties are performing and it's it's just insights, you know, motivation yes. to perform. So, so this is creating the baseline for 2023 where we're ending the year at. So they'll have this we'll use this when we said each employee's performance goals for the new year as well. And base have them look at this and then say where what are your goals for the new year? Uh Lisa Kernays, you did pretty good here from the days that you were thinking. Just seeing what else. Oh, yeah, so it's these... per month. Per month. Okay. Yeah, enter it per month and then it uh, tallies it all up top. So I have another meeting today where we're going to set more of the goals with um, compliance, more of the goals with um, maintenance. I'm going to work with Tracy because our compliance, we have a few more matrices and, and uh, measurements to work out. But I feel this, I learned a lot from each course this week and I, each report took me about two hours. And I was just like, wow, some of the information I was learning by pulling different reports and actually counting the days for maintenance work orders for research, how many past few research, which may not be, they were passed only by a day or two, but there's so much room for improvement. And I think this will be a huge uh, eye opener for just maintenance and managers going into the new year. 
and that they know that we're watching this a little more closely. How often are you inputting data? This will be us updated monthly. And is that going to fall under yes. responsibility? But managers will have new reports to send monthly. They've been doing weekly reports for the last year, but we're going to add now in a monthly report where they'll pull this data and submit it and we already report. So. Okay. so they've gotten a taste of it, but we're going to really dive in and go over the purpose and what we're hoping to see and then be part of the goal setting. And it's actually much more uh, new forms of we updated the maintenance weekly reports to add stuff that's going to be reflected on this where they add with each turn so that they're reporting to managers. We just implemented two weeks ago that maintenance is meeting daily with managers because they were both kind of in their own little worlds and I'm like, no, you guys got to touch base daily. And so that's going to help, I think, improve this where the data in Yardi is going to be even more updated to some maintenance to say, I've done this before, I've done this turn, can you please make sure it's updated today? And then, then somebody else is checking in on the managers to make sure they're getting it in. So separate and apart from this, we're running a module out for the part of our maintenance system. So a few years ago, the city went away from the annual performance reviews because um, I would sit in my office and see at the end of the year these lines and everybody coming in for the annual review and it wasn't accomplishing anything because you're not dealing with issues or rewarding um, early on. So we we shifted as a city six years ago, seven years ago to it's more of an ongoing communication and documentation. Now our HR system has taken some time because we've been converting and we're bringing the new system in play for next year and what that's going to do is real time when we have conversations or an issue put the information in and it just starts both good and bad and it just starts aggregating it so that and then that automatically will send it to so if I write something about <coughs> about Molly sends it to Molly Molly reads it Molly has to acknowledge that she read it she doesn't have to agree with it Molly can write her comments in, and then it just starts capturing it. So that then it, it is a real time system that we're using to, to deal with things, both good and bad, much earlier in the process. This will then feed into that. When you send that feedback, I'm assuming you have a conversation with them before they get a random email about something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> just making sure. <laughs> You're on the right. Which I think that's great because I when I started at the county, I remember my first like performance review going in and being like shocked because apparently I had been doing something wrong for nine months and I'm like, why yeah. didn't you say something nine months ago? Right. So this is awesome. I love that real time yeah. feedback. Yeah. And we do we've had conversations with L staff. I mean, we I've got monthly meetings with all of my direct reports. Lisa does it all the time, um, but this will be more tracking. Yeah, quantitative. Show us what you got. It's gonna help us keep things from falling through the cracks. Sometimes, like with reasonable accommodations, uh, incidents, grievances, they'll get an email from a resident, but it never gets my the process. Yeah, so this they'll track. They'll have a new report, which is like an ADA and a grievance log, and they'll track that as well. And even if they don't have all the documents needed for the reasonable accommodation, or they're just were made aware of an incident. At least it's going to be on that tracking log, and we can keep the follow through going through. And I'm made aware, so I don't get a blind call from a resident and be like, um, "Okay, well, let me look into that." I'll have some of the details already up front. That's crazy. So going back to the monthly meetings, then are you? Is the standard practice to record the conversation? You know, quote point the conversation, whatever it gets sent to the report, and then you guys agree on it. So it kind of it. Across the city, it, it varies by work group. Um, what I do is we have monthly conversations about either struggles or things that we need to address, or just this is our time together to go over things that have been waiting. So sometimes I do do a, um, annual goals at the beginning and then kind of a recap at the end of what you accomplished and what to work on for the next year. So that's where currently it's kind of recorded, but a lot of the monthlies are really more informal and less of a more critical issue with the, the yeah. notes and documentation. So I we, we kind of operate on the similar where we have monthly and then we also do the semi-annual performance and the, the risk that you can 
run and you'll only draw you one grade unless you have a manager that just will never meet some percent. Because they say they are, or it's they're supposed to be, but they don't. And so then if you don't have a performance assessment in there at some point, then you never catch it. And if you go on for one grade, so. Well, that's part of our daily, the manager and uh, maintenance meeting, it's uh, manager assistant and maintenance meeting, they are coming off at their meeting daily. So that somebody can say, well, I didn't know about that work order, I didn't know about that unit turn, I didn't know about that resident issue, they're all signing off on the agenda daily. Yeah, part of it is, you're, you're right, you just need to be in that, you know, and that's why we have been pushing for that dual function, because it's, it's pretty easy as a manager to go in and look at, you know, what are you doing? Like, you know, because if you go two months without filling it out, the first problem um, where we've also caught it, Like, uh, just do great. What does that mean? 
what you're doing. Yeah. And it's like, well, what am I doing? Yeah. <laughs> the biggest thing for my staff is bringing this report on is they all want more money in their budgets, and this is going to help them measure it. Well, what's, what's costing us money? unit terms, the time that units are down, the not balance, aggressively leasing, the AR balances, the gross rent potential, not meeting that gross rent potential, what we can do to get to there. And so I think this is going to kind of be the measurement, and as we go into 2025, we'll able to see, well, we've increased our income, we've increased this. This has gone down, and this is all we need to do, an extra $10,000 in our budget. So. And this is all going to tie into resident engagement as well, because um, now I, I remember years ago, hearing that property managers were like, well, why can't we do this? The residents want to do, why can't we? Now we'll know. We can or can't, and here's why. And then they can answer them quickly instead of letting me find out for you and then taking a month exactly. to get back to them. And now the, um, as she's shown them how to access their budgets and see real-time data, they can see where we stand for the resident funds and other funds like, well, why haven't we done this? Well, we're waiting a month or we're doing this. So, yeah, it's all tied together. So. If a employee wanted to for their, their education, does the city in any way be involved in making for tuition or books or any that kind of stuff? We have a tuition reimbursement program that's just recently undergone an update um, that our elderly employees have access to. So we do 
citywide classes of which the housing authority can attend. Sometimes we mandate classes of de-escalation. We bring in um, a lot of guest speakers to come in. So what was the guy's name that we brought in when we were doing standards? Brian, Brian Dowd. Brian Dowd, who is out of Chicago, who specializes in interactions with the catalyst and people in permanent support of housing. And he did a training to talk about any composite in de escalation to accountability. So we do those on a regular basis. Uh, and we have a schedule where people can just go online and sign up. Again, part of the responsibility is going in and saying, I need you to have you done this, I need you to take this. Um, and then sometimes we mandate it, like uh, the uh, anti Semitism work that we did with anti Defamation League. Um, because of things that we were seeing in some of our property wide residents, we actually mandated that LHJ staff attended that. The city staff, it was optional. But in some areas, um, supervisors were really like, yeah, you need to go there. Uh, so we have a pretty robust training class, training program uh, that's led by Julie Stone and then. Like for example, I'm getting ready next year to come in and do one on re re engaging in the city's cultural attributes. Also, um, attaching uh, a few other things to that where it's mandatory for everyone. Um, and I lead all of those training sort of training sessions with other staff members um, to try to rely on some of the standards that they do with the board and outdoor. So every so often, I'll come in and just see like 24 to 36 training classes in the year of what my expectations are so that we can kind of place one. And I think that's important the three of us remember what the staffing was like when we first joined in 2020. Um, there wasn't a lot of, there were some shady characters working at LHA doing some shady things. And this is helpful because it'll make sure everybody's invested in the mission, which is really important. We have a training on December 1st. That's yeah, why. All of LHA, uh, except for accounting, unless they, it's optional for accounting, <laughs> we're doing mental health first day yeah. together for a whole day on. I don't know, you guys might need that for each other. <laughs> <laughs> well, so we do, um, so peer support, I don't know if you've heard of peer support, but it started in police. Um, many, many years ago, so Longmont was one of the first cities to have uh, police peer support, so it's pretty robust. We then expanded to fire police support, and then we expanded to organizational peer support. So, um, anytime we have an issue, or frankly, any kind of issue, if people have peers throughout the organization, they can talk to and then those individuals are trained and work under a licensed uh, psychologist. And, and they can work with them and go, okay, Eric, you, know, you might want to really think about getting into a more formal treatment program and talk about the advisor. Significant events, we actually will bring the team in and, and actively engage with them. So, simply like a golf course employee that got failed in an accident. Not a choice. We brought peer support in with the psychologist and others to really ground everyone in what's happening. Um, and, and so that's a different function that we have to support staff because they, uh, yeah, they go through some pretty tough stuff. Thank you. Anything else on operations? So one thing that we did is um, made some adjustments staffing wise and so now all the maintenance and vehicle maintenance folks are reporting in Dave. And then Dave is reporting to Lisa so that you know reducing that span of control because the span of control is too wide and that becomes tough to manage and so now you know the maintenance side is really coming into play to so consistency. So that change is made in this structural thing. Questions? Well, the 
Right, so I have the voluntary compliance agreement update and accessibility improvements. Right, so um, we did complete all of the assignments under, so I should go back for some, some of our newer members. Um, in 2019, HUD and LHA came into a voluntary compliance agreement. This means HUD found deficiencies or um, specifically following HUD rules and specifically targeting on uh, ADA compliance. So um, the LHA team prior to the city coming on, coming and when the city came on after, led by Kathy and, and Karen at the time, they took the lead on going through, it was it's a massive agreement of all of the items that LHA was required, even though it's voluntary, but required to uh, modify to meet HUD requirements. So all of the deliverables required as part of that agreement um, were completed between 2019 and the end of 2022. The last thing that we submitted at the end of 2022 was our physical accessibility survey of every property um, showing any ADA deficiency and what needs to be done to correct it and the timeline for correction. You've got five years, actually it's seven years to correct it. Um, we plan on correcting things in much less than seven years, but we did line that all out. Um, that was the last kind of homework item to complete the BCA. And while it feels like that's the closeout piece of the BCA, because you have to complete those items over seven years, it's never truly closed, it's just that it's it's not, you're not under under the, um, the eagle eye while you're completing most of those items. So I wanted to share. Oh, is that a question, Glenn? No, okay. Um, there may be sensory units in some of the properties, but 
we could not verify based on the records that we had and our history of inspections. So we just covered all the bases. That was $25,000, so it's a CDEG COVID grant. Um, we used $53,000 on doing concrete work at four properties. The last one, the, well, actually that's on the next one. These are all complete as of this week. The city is coming in with $64,000 of ARPA funding to finish our ADA concrete work because the concrete is very expensive and difficult to bid. Um, and the last one, the Briarwood, that work is ongoing right now. It should wrap up on Monday and then all of our concrete work is done. Um, we've got parking signs, ADA entrance signs. These are small things, but we're trying to just uh, use up every dollar of grant funds to fill the need. Came in and had to do um, asphalt, new asphalt at Hearthstone and Lodge, and we had to do a very various funding sources to cover this with the budgets that we had. Um, we did a regular CDBG grant for the asphalt. We came in with the CV, the COVID funds for the seal, because we had to get the seal to get the ADA parking, the striping done. It was a very highly coordinated effort. Um, and then down here, these are not ADA issues, but these are other priorities. So the cameras project, we're in the process of ordering the cameras themselves. The install will happen in 2024. And the playground at Aspen Meadows neighborhood has been replaced and is, is up and running. Um, so we're prepping, as soon as we get that last concrete project done this week, we're gonna uh, show a like, slideshow to the board. So I will share that with you once we have it. Um, but. Here's our, just to show you the effort, this is over $300,000 worth of ADA work from four different funding sources, trying to piece it all together like a puzzle. Um, so that's what we've been working on in 2023 to really show HUD that we are taking this seriously and getting the big ticket items taken care of as much as we can. Um, but at the same time, we submitted that physical accessibility report in December, 2022. Um, in September, or October maybe, October of this year, they finally reviewed it. <laughs> so um, there was actually some missing, there was an exhibit to the old BCA from 2019 that had some additional items they want added onto the physical accessibility report. So our ADA consultant is coming out here on the week of November 27th, staying in a hotel and hitting all of our properties to mark off the new items that HUD wanted to see, which I'll tell a story about in a moment, and verify that all the improvements we've done in 2022 are done to standard, so we can report to HUD that's complete. Um, so the example of things that HUD had on their exhibit that we did not, that our ADA compliance, who is HUD approved him as our qualified inspector, um, the drinking fountain here at the suites, is it in the lobby? Yeah. They're supposed to have, I'm gonna make up the number, but it's something like 27 inches of knee clearance underneath for a wheelchair. We have 26 and three quarters inches. For that quarter inch, we would have to move plumbing and redo that. So it's, it's stuff like that. It is um, very clear that in 2019, HUD was coming down hard. And when we had a conversation with them to verify what are you going to make sure we were doing exactly what they wanted, we asked, is there any construction allowance for like a quarter inch, a half inch? Is there any sort of flexibility on that? And they said yes. And so we're going to put in, for example, that specific one and request the variance for that. So they're being, they're seeing the progress and being more flexible with us now um, because moving the plumbing for a quarter inch is just, <laughs> so, so anyways um you know it's still ongoing but the good news is they are seeing the progress they're seeing the effort the commitment and they are responding with some flexibility so that's the update so we are with that so i got back to you guys on september on our um did they give any sort of guidance or is there some sort of guidance that we're aware of from the whole process the village is aware of about how to prioritize um i don't know i guess just certain projects or does it come down to fund the complicated you know funding yeah. sources and how to like piece it together so there's no one or two things like this has got to be done in 2024. no okay. they, they did leave it up to us to decide that and we decided
decided that the sensor units were critical because that was something that was across all the properties. And then um, we knew that the concrete was going to be incredibly hard to, and the asphalt was going to be incredibly hard to budget ourselves. And so we needed to act and try and get grant funds for that. So we moved in. Right. Yeah. So. so I just want to say that the parking lot actually was wonderful, especially that very big hole. So it's right there. You mean the hole is gone, right? <laughs> yeah, that's that's not the new hole. It was like, was that just in like water? Yeah, it's just yeah. drainage over time for the last 15 years. Yeah, we had some design issues that were embedded. So, okay. like when we first took over, Spring Creek was six years old, and they had some fundamental design issues in the driveway coming in, and it was already eroding the concrete. And so we had to, that was one of the things we did right away and just fixed because it was not major damage. So, yeah, quality of construction and things like that are a big issue. Um, <clears throat> on this, on all issue, um, I had this on my list for Eric, kind of figured I'd tell her before I told you all. Uh, one of the things we did is we created a, a strategic integration group within the organization. So that's really our data analytics. Uh, folks and they are working so um, in this budget we created a project management office and so they're bringing um, PMO work and training into the organization but we're also in the process of converting to Microsoft project so we have any number of departments using different project management uh, software and um, so we're consolidating in the project um, Erica. I want Erica to go into that training so that she can then take Molly's spreadsheets and dump them into the project because then our strategic integration office uses Power BI to then create the dashboards that we can use so that um, you know any one of us can click on the screen and see where everything's sitting and it'll alert you to if you're starting to get behind so that we don't miss that ones. And, um, so I have a few dashboards built for me so I can see every capital project that we have in the city. Where are we on spin? Where are we on timing? If there's a hitch or a problem, what's the problem? And um, it's going to continue to automate to the point to when a significant problem hits, it will alert certain levels based on what's happening. So really integrating Power BI into this a big thing for all of us and even the advisory board because it's being set up to where uh, the advisory or this is the only advisory board we'll probably do it with but the advisory board and the council they're going to have a high level dashboard that they can see uh, we'll be able to dig into the details um, but yeah. uh, definitely having something more front end to see what's going on Because we need to get um, the order of reporting and the 
easements that they need for access and parking and um, a bunch of things. So we're got we have those easements drafted and being circulated around a bunch of attorneys, and we should still be able to. That's the last side and left to get the CPD but CPWD building sold. So that is targeted for by the by November 30th, um, and then turn around and close on Village on May December 6th. So the we're, the last thing to finalize our construction contract is uh, radon testing. They the investors <coughs> just redo some radon testing, which we did yesterday. So we're just seeing if that if we need to install any uh, mitigation system or not, and then our construction contract will get finalized, and we're cruising along. Um, we meet with the residents on Friday to do the big relocation, here's the whole plan meeting. And so I invite everybody to come if you'd like to hear. Um, it's on Friday at 3.30. And that will kick off that for, for residents. They will not be moving out and construction will not start until January 16th. Um, so they got a little bit of leeway <coughs> time after the holidays. Um, our relocation team that we hired is wonderful. Senior services will be there to help because they just, they've lived through it with us on um, um, So we're moving in, we've been in high gear, but it's about to be very real. Um, then for uh, ascent to overcrossing, we're here we are at November 14th. We are really hoping to hear on a Chaffa award or not, but hopefully, yes. Um, very soon. It's supposed to be in November, so we will notify everybody as soon as we know that. Um, in the meantime, we're continuing design at an appropriate pace. We're not rushing design to spend a bunch of money before we have the award, but we know we're doing this project. It's just, do we get the award now or do we try again? So pushing forward there, um, including finding funding for the Early Childhood Education Center. So the city has come in with uh, the ARPA funding that we got. Has, post-COVID funding, that money sits in a bank, well, sits in our accounts, and it's an interest-bearing account, and interest has been earned on the ARPA funds that we've had um, sitting waiting to be expended, and that that money is now available for award and use. So uh, we propose to city council to use some of that to help fund the ECE for about $500,000 worth, and so that is, is um, it's committed. We're still working with the Colorado Health Foundation. We did get an invitation to apply, which um, that it sounds like a pretty short list compared to um, the level that they usually consider, which is hopeful. Um, we're working with the Longmont Community Foundation. They do want to assist, but we are trying to sort out if the financial mechanisms that a LIHTC project requires would fit with what they're trying to do, um, but they are interested. They've talked about $750,000. We just need to see if we can do an instrument that would work for them and for the project. Um, and then we have worthy cause funding in um, an application in for that as well, and we hear about that in December. So we're really hopeful that maybe by the end of December, we'll know um, the scoop on the Early Childhood Education Center. Village Police, Hober, Zinnia, we're in construction. We're <laughs> <laughs> you can see it out there. Apparently we're hoping to go with framing this week, which is going to be really exciting. Um, is there anything else, any, uh, any resident communication, uh, coordination items that we need to work through? We brought up the moment, and okay. I'm meeting with Zenny a week. Yeah, the construction team. Um, Was well, a parking lot here going to get resurfaced as well? As all the yeah, sections? so they've done, there is new concrete out there now where they laid the utility lines. I noticed that. It yeah. looks pretty great. But there's going to be other work to do, but we're not going to do it until construction's over, so we don't tear it up. Um, and we have to budget for that or apply for a grant for that as well. So, um, but that will be, since they'll be constructing through three quarters of 2024, that will be probably a 2025 project. Um, Recovery Cafe, um, we are still working with Recovery Cafe. We. There's, there's some concern about if they build it on this property, there will be, they're having a hard time getting financing to figure out how to finance a ground lease to do the building. Because um, the, in 
investors of this property are okay with the ground lease, but they would not subordinate to another mortgage. And so there's there's some financing tools that we need to uh, kind of sort through. And in the meantime, they're thinking about backup plans too, but either way, whatever happens, if it's not a building on site, we would be bringing in a satellite office here where they could set up and provide services here on site. So we're still working through that. It's very complicated. It's much easier to do this type of thing in the beginning of the deal rather than after. So that's still in the works. Um, so we were trying to get through CPWD first and various projects, but we're getting at least we're making sure like that concrete work gets done so that we are handing over a eventually handing over a building that serves appropriately their clientele, which are often disabled veterans. And so um, we're working on that kind of work with them and We've been shifting unit assignments at Briarwood to come up with some unrestricted units, meaning they don't have DOH funds on them or um, <coughs> thank you, project-based voucher on them so that we have more flexibility to do a preference for veterans. So we're, we're internally doing the, the switch on that side. Um, and then we wanna talk to them about what is the model? How do we do this? We could start bringing veterans into Briarwood, and then if the property conveys, they just can stick around. Um, we're trying to sort out how that would best work right now. Yeah, part of it is they're having to buy a, they got hit with some construction cost increases, and so they're really kind of still focused on the final uh, with raising the board better project. Um, and so that's really trying to find a lender based on where interest rates are today and what they can do in terms of getting a loan or how we can construct the financing for them on, on Brownwood uh, because they're dependent on donations. And uh, so in talking to them, they, they really want to finish that and then you know, take time to figure out the process and say, you know, we can still lease it to you. Um, ideally, they got a little um, concerned about well, you want to put veterans in, and they were wondering if they had to do property management. I'm like, yeah, we'll still property manage it, but it's easier to get veterans in because they're probably your clients anyway, and it helps with accountability. So uh, we just need to get back to veterans. Um, not including relocation. 
So how's that affecting the, the relationship is pal is like how our relationship with pal is still good carrie uh, Feld is the project manager she's she's nice she's wonderful to work with and she said we will fix this the relationship with ej is better it was that's a scary thing yeah it's a scary thing for a small architecture firm um, to have that where you have to put that on your resume when you when you go for other jobs so that's a scary thing um, in terms of the business but that's why insurance is there i mean we don't have a source to pay for it and it's our only choice so well i'm part of it mean, just to be frank i'm always brought this to me at the end of the day i didn't care about the relationship i cared about the product yeah and so i get that they were anxious and concerned but they didn't give us what we needed yep and it was like I just hope you can be contentious. Uh, it may. It may be. It, may. it is what it means. It's the business yeah. of development. Yeah, it is right. what it is. I mean, see, the, the manufacturers <coughs> were. That is a root cause as well. Where they say, I warned you. And we say, So your floors can't handle an office chair? And you say for light residential use. I'm like, this is an apartment building. I, yeah, so it it's, expect. there is, yep. So anyways, we're moving forward, okay? All right, let's go Right, they really, really need another $500,000 project. All right, let's go on to number six items for input. Board commissioners, uh, A is community manager, and then policy. Is this one of the things that you had to have for? Her? No. Okay. This is something we wanted to do. I'm going to let Lisa take over, but this is something we wanted to do because we now have community managers living on site, and we wanted to make sure that everything was fair and equitable and established standards and all on the same page. Not just between those living in the units, but other LAG employees that may not have, they perceive that they don't have access to that, so yeah. So this is our rough draft. We just got this from the attorneys Friday afternoon. Um, I'm already making my edits on here as well. Um, she, like she said, we do have managers living on site. This will help us minimize, uh, minimize and avoid eviction processes. If somebody's terminated, we're trying to kind of just make the whole process easier that they're not entitled to the unit, just our manager, they have responsibilities. There'll be other documents coming. We are adding responsibilities to managers who live on site as um, not that it's this unit is part of their compensation, but with living there, they have additional duties. Part of those include ADA snow removal. So when we start getting the snow falling and um, the plow can't make it there, they're going to be out there shoveling ADA parking spots and ADA accesses. Weekly lighting checks, making sure all of our exterior lightings are working at night because we don't have maintenance on site at night. Um, responding to emergencies, including health and safety items, welfare checks, emergency lockouts where a child went, like I respond to where a child has locked the parents out of the house. And you know, I don't want them to wait on maintenance for 45 minutes with a toddler in there, so I'll go do that. So things like that, um, we're going to require the staff to do with living on site. How we built into the agreement? And there'll be an additional form of additional agreements, so we'll be bringing those back as we get those done. But this was our first step in getting this um, Occupy agreement. What do we have now? Do we have anything currently? Managers are on site? Currently, no. They, um, some have signed leases. We have the background checks on all the additional household members. So the staff has gone through background checks when they got a, a employed with the city and us. Um, but for Spouses, children, anybody who's over 18 in the unit have gone through background checks. And these are not subject to a white tax. Correct. They've these all been just... approved by lenders and investors and Shaka. So we followed the standard lease up procedures, same as other residents, including deposits, et cetera. But um, this is really to manage on the employee side where we want to see expectations. If this is this could be viewed as a fringe benefit from somebody that doesn't live on a unit and they want to know what are they getting for this that I'm not. So we're going to make sure it's clear expectations and fair enough. Sorry, so, this, oh, uh, so for the security deposit, so 
paragraph eight, it says there's not going to be one. I'm just confused. But are you saying like there normally is? Um, or is that? Yes. We have a yes, so okay. Um, but I'm going to work with the attorney. I think there's gotcha. a to add a clause that upon inspection, if there is a need, that we can charge for right. That makes sense, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. I also just want to ask about paragraph 11, um, or clause 11. So this almost seems like a like an arbitration clause, you know, which you see it means a bunch, but that's obviously not the direction this is going. It's just saying to a you know a competent court basically in Boulder County. Was there a reason to know that the lawyer wanted to go that way, or you guys wanted to go that way to basically say we want this to go to a court of original jurisdiction to have the judge decide the issues as opposed to like having the arbitration staff? I think um, based on um, the attorney who did this up, his fighting or using something similar in court, he figured this would be the best and easiest way for LHA to proceed. Okay. Yeah, so we, typically, we typically stay away from arbitration. Right, and do you, and is it standard to just say then that we just want like a bench trial basically? Is that in kind of the city's conference? Yeah, this is kind of the language, yeah. That makes sense. He did recreate this as well based on his experience with other housing authorities in Colorado yeah. that, that have similar policies. Well, and just they're like waiving a, their right to a trial. We'll do a jury trial, but yeah. it's not going to a judge, so yeah. That makes sense. And then yeah. just a tiny typo venue like is where something is, so just. I would suggest standing up that in the Fort Boulder County and yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry, no, that paragraph 11 on the third line. It's like venue is long on its own. Gotcha. <coughs> Sorry. So, can you explain a little bit about um, 9A if we actually are going to offer the terminated or the, or the employee the option to stay in the there could be circumstances. So, say I had a somebody who qualified for the senior property. Let's break through here. So, say 56, and they qualify for the house, housing. They've had a change in circumstances. Maybe they're not leaving on bad terms. They're retiring, and so they would be eligible to stay in the unit. We could work with Kappa and investors to just change that employee unit and let them remain housed. Okay. So they wouldn't. They have to vacate right. just because yeah. they leave. Terminating for that was that was if they qualify, so yeah, yeah. they have a program requirement, yeah. So they either have to qualify, yes, as a, in the family or a senior, correct. So, and I'm sure you have a really good explanation for this one. 10 and 12 are word for word exactly the same, and is there a reason for that? I think this is our first draft from our attorney, I'm yeah. We're going to talk about that one. <laughs> <laughs> Find something else you yeah. can add it yeah. in later. But is a unit that is designated as a manager unit? Is it a particular unit that we have? Is it like on the first floor? It depends. Okay. It depends per property. So, like the Hearthstone and the Suites have designated managers units that will always be managers units and never available to the general public. Right. Um, Fall River, Aspen Senior, and Village Place all have kind of a floating employee unit that could be rented to the general public if it was an occupied by management or it could be an employee unit and it could go to a different unit based on the household needs as well so the ability for a former employee who qualifies to stay in a unit if they were living in a specific designated manager unit that would only be open to them to stay if another unit was available correct so they they don't just get to stay in that unit yeah, depending on the property so yeah it's okay. on property and availability we think that references is that okay here, Lisa? Or do we need to? I don't know. Like we reserve the right. Yeah. So yeah, there we go. it's no, flexible. Yeah. yeah. And so depending, we could, if they met the properties criteria, we can always transfer them as well and not lose the occupancy. Yeah. Transfer them to an empty unit. And then I guess the people that you know are allowed to also occupy the unit number five, they're not required to sign this as well. No, well, this is just for the employee, um, but they will sign the other lease documents, the house um, house rules, uh, crime free addendum, anything like that. They will all be subject to sign. Well, what if we have an issue with one of these other individuals that occupy the unit? I think that's receiving anything about terminating the lease. We have that's, an issue with them. that's covered in their lease it? agreement yeah. since it's not a contract with the employee. Okay. Okay. So it's got to yeah, I would say in number eight, employees required to 
to abide by the non-monetary obligation of such rules for the community. I would say employee and household. I would add that in to cover that. However, they're referred to as by. Seven basically just even um, open the option for the LHA to be like, no, that's an absurd thing you have in your <laughs> in your apartment. Yeah. You got to get it out, yeah. or is it like you guys actually have to take off like furniture and fixtures and no, stuff that they've done? Yeah, but you have an elephant in there, and like, yeah. 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 Okay. we'll be bringing this to the board either November thirtieth, and we can wrap it all up by this Friday. Oh, I know what for ten. Okay. Employee okay. further agrees that allowing any unauthorized occupants to result in LHA terminating this license to occupy agreement can be result in termination of your lease overall. Because it could be a violation of the regular lease. I know this is your first draft. <laughs> <laughs>
I suppose we'll be dropping off here shortly. The ones here, uh, 7312, that was down for over a year. That was the one that was met, and then they completely ripped it up. Uh, the contractor didn't close off the window during the deep freeze, and then we had pipes burst in it. Then it became another insurance claim on top of it. So they're, they've already got drywall in, they're working on cabinetry, painting, and painting now. Um, B2, that was the one that uh, was at the neighborhood where we ran out of insurance money in 2022, that we partnered with Habitat as their contractor. So now we have duct work, drywall, painting and letting all going on. Um, so those should be completed by the end of this month and then we'll start piecing it really together through LHA staff for most of the other items. C1 and 8, 86 over at the neighborhood were light contamination. They didn't have to rip out anything except for one bathroom each unit. So our adjuster just walked and we're hoping to have to go ahead and move forward on those here this week. Village Place, um, that one is hopefully be getting rebuilt next week. We've signed the contract, we've gotten everything figured out. The contractor was only supposed to rip out the drywall in the bathroom in the kitchen and pick out the cabinets and that is the whole unit. Oh no. Yeah. So. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, they're putting it all back. So. Okay. I was gonna say it's versus just possible. included in the yeah. project. No. 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 They need to pay for this. <laughs> yeah. 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 So they, they are paying to rebuild the back the bedroom and the living room and the dining room. And then so we work with our adjuster to have those costs separated of what they're paying for and what is being under the insurance money. So. so they're taking care of the insurance money. <coughs> and who's doing? It will be a kind of a clean slate. So they'll get it textured, budded, and everything, and leave a clean slate for everything that we already plan to do in the project in the room, which is painting and trim, and we're going to do all that. So they're just going to drive all the texture, and then we just have less demo to do. <laughs> And instead of filing an insurance claim on it, was there a way to include it? Well, years. that would be a budget hit to the project, which was not our responsibility necessarily. So we wanted them to make good on their mistake. But it did just stop at the point where we would then pick up and we wouldn't be. We didn't want them to. Okay, that's it's, right. It's yes, the that's contractor's right. insurance yeah. claim. Yeah. And so they're rebuilding it to the point of where we would have started. Yeah. And so cool. they're not going full, they're just going to the point of where we would be. Yeah. And it's not our insurance. But we weren't being wasteful. We, made, we figured out the line to stop where we weren't having them put something in and yeah. then we were just going to rip it out. Right. So. Yes. Okay. That, that's the the biggest part is getting them to document what they were taking care of, what we needed them to do, and just working out through the insurances and everything. So. Okay, um, I included pictures of my property updates just so you can see what's going on because I'm like, I feel like they're very boring. So we've had a lot of um, Kaiser Permanente has a whole nonprofit arm, and they're reached, they reached out to us wanting to do a lot of they have money for craft events, chocolate tasting, stuff like that, nutrition stuff. So they started with craft events at some of our properties and they'll be doing one property every other week going forward through 2024. Um, we brought snow removal in-house. Um, managers and I are clearing ADA accesses and we got our own snow plow. First snowstorm went really good. Um, residents were out there cheering, yelling out their windows and stuff. So it was quite, quite a, a different change than what we're used to with the snow. Um, suites call for services remain low. Um, the manager has started a food pantry here. Um, she started doing a lot of more events. She lives on site with her kids and stuff. So they did a pajamas and pancakes event, um, pumpkin decorating. Um, they got their military, oh, she took it hers down. Some of it's still up over on the counter. A lot of our properties did military appreciation events for November. Um, and like I said, a food donation area where uh, we're getting surplus from other properties and organizations so that the residents here at the suites get uh, a supply of food. Um, we used to get farmers market, but now that the farmers market is kind of ending for the year, they're not getting those uh, weekly donations. Aspen Senior um, Elder Share began doing food drops twice a month there. In November, we'll actually have three to supplement food for the residents there. And it's stuff that they can use. We've been getting ground hamburger, gallons of milk, eggs, uh, sausage, you name it. It's stuff that residents can actually make a meal out of. Uh, 
two of my employees have become volunteers with Elder Share. So they go and they report to Elder Share what the residents are requesting um, so that they're not just getting, before they were getting like beans and gabonzo beans and stuff, things residents really didn't use. And so our, my staff was able to report to them saying, <coughs> residents want something that they can use as a meal so that we can get any more, even like the canned spaghetti, canned um, pastas or different dishes, beef stew, soup, stuff like that that they can, or a ready-made meal, or multiple items that they can make into a meal. So that's really helped three of our properties um, increase that. Now we're working to get Hearthstone and Lodge at the same level as the other two properties. <coughs> um, like I said, RBC was out last week, the investor for Aspen Senior, they had no findings, all our files were great, only concerned with flooring and renting those units. Um, Aspen Meadows neighborhood, the playground was installed. The third picture in the back shows our new playground. It is used a lot. <laughs> Good, I was wondering about that. So about eight, nine o'clock at night, daily. <laughs> so the reason we redid that is um, it, it was unsafe. I mean, we had it, we had it uh, off taken off because it was just unsafe for kids. It was just wear and tear. Broken boards and part of these uh, play structure is ADA accessible and all that too. Um, I didn't include that picture, but it is. Um, Village Place, uh, that manager, she is now starting to host uh, veterans coffee every month. And so uh, veterans community project has come in to one of those and she has different uh, veterans groups lined up to come in monthly for the next six months. And she's had about, and it's not just veterans, it's veterans families, military families, and she has, last, her last one had over 25 residents and family members in attendance. Mortgage company came out for Spring Creed. Well, they're coming out, um, oh, getting site and file review end of this month. Um, Fall River, they started fall bucks, so they, um, a lot of our, you'll see we have coffee stations at our properties, and so they call it fall, fall bucks, and the manager goes out and makes coffee with the residents in the morning, and kind of just getting that <coughs> personal relationship done, and the asphalt repair is at Hearthstone and Lodge, so. Y'all will have to go <coughs> their pictures and the fun, and so these pictures come from four different properties. Mm -hmm. the ghost and the ornaments and oh, I like the old friend that too. Are we still doing the via shuttle? Yes. Is that like built in for next year as well? Of course. It is. Um, so partially it will be paid by the city and they've also put a chunk of money just in case. Um, we think we're going to have control bridge this year. That'll carry forward, but just in case we don't, we can have some plan. It's going to be the year after that where we're going to have this 2025. Yeah, because it's a, it's a huge chunk of money. It's twenty five thousand dollars, and we couldn't put it in the property system. Yeah, like it was just it was just too much to put everybody. In. Yeah, we tried. So we might have to get creative sometime next year coming up with future funding. Yeah. Okay. So one of the things that um, I have talked to a couple of the council members about is getting some additional funding to carry us through 2026, which I think they're going to bring up these times. Is that 25K per property? No, 25K for all properties. Oh, we can find that. Well, Arlene's talked to some council members, and so I think. As for 45. As for the contingency, which gives us more time to do uh, <laughs> <laughs> I got a spot for you on the Elizabeth Bivens Affordable Housing Network sponsorship <laughs> <laughs> Really good at asking for money. <laughs> Let's go to the age receivables. So we have um, in total this year turned over $338,000 in expansions. We have seen nothing back. And we wrote off about 10,000. Usually, the, the ones that are getting written off is due to the systems um, that have just passed on. They, they have cleaned up their, their units, and we just have to pass that to the next So, um, I think mean, we finally got one tenant that called recently and must have gotten reached by the collection agency. Um, but we have heard crickets from any of the others. So, yeah. <laughs> were, were you just going to ask? Well, I was just, if a person is late, so I, and I can't remember correctly, but I think Brandon 
minutes two on the fifth. Is that correct? It's the seventh. The seventh. The seventh. So the person is late. When do we start saying to them you need to get in here? Well, on the eighth, we give notice with the late fee attached. Okay. So, and then if they get an eviction, that one. So on the third day, we're currently doing the thirty days between the eighth and tenth, depending on what day of the month and what our schedules look like. It's a 30 day notice instead of the 10 day now, so we have to wait a full 30 days. And then once that expires, then the attorney back on it. So it rolls over into the next month, and then they're another month behind. So hopefully, we won't have those big amounts. Yeah, yeah that's right. I think when we stepped in, <laughs> those of you all that stepped in in 20, I mean, we were finding people that hadn't paid rent six, in seven, six yeah. seven months. And so that's a big operational issue. And we're even watching now. I have like <coughs> this week, so the rents may not, the residence portions may not be big, but once they hit the two mark, two month mark, and even if it's only $200, we're beginning that process. Just because we know the process now is going to be a little longer by the time you take do the 30 day notice, and you get a court date with, with all the holidays through, now you're four months behind. Four months behind, and now the sheriff is 45 to 60 days out as well. Yeah. And there's no more rental assistance. Correct. Yeah. So, there's one group in Denver who is helping right now that mediation is referring to, but the chances of them getting that timely is slow. Well, the balance we have to be at about 59000 of them is actually past instance that we're looking through the might be in the process of collections. Um, so there's only 10000 in all of our properties that has an actual balance. Um, some of them are still working through the eviction process and so you know those could actually transfer to charges that are passed again um they're not quite passed yet because <laughs> they're still working through the eviction process that are still so i have through eviction. a couple right now um i have four at some point in the eviction process right now i, I know two here one fall river which we can reach with we reached the simulation agreement on yesterday and then one more for spring creek. So. And this would be kind of a, a, another opportunity for um, when you do the retreat as an option, you know, if the community managers can actually get the collection from this. That maybe we do the same thing and we send it to a collection agency and they're getting the proper from actually getting the collections and working at a payment point. Um, they have a good get A lot of the times you don't see people get a full name address. And they don't give an address, so if everything's in the middle, um, so it's kind of hard for them to connect if they're not in communication with the tenant. But if they could, it could be an opportunity for them to get some additional connections if they can work out the payment plan. So that was one thing that has been thrown around, and Lisa's seen in other property managers' comments that they offer to employee versus the collection agency. Um, as for okay. and then the difference between because you have June on here and September, the difference in the amounts so five hundred twenty-six thousand versus the one thousand. Is that from the white office that you did? Yes. You did I noticed that my print yeah. area got so there was yeah there was a huge write-off in July okay. that occurred, okay. uh, which adds up to the thirty-eight thousand. Yeah. So that's what it dropped. And I'm just doing that quarterly. Um, since the last week you saw this June, just adding such a person so that you can see the difference in the quarters, quarterly change. Um, as for the financials, I mean most most items that are over budget or cause of concern, um, a lot of it's vacancy. Um, what we what we realized in our path of budgeting is um, we may budget at a 95% vacancy rate, and Lisa may say we are, we're at 98%, but it's all dependent upon the units that are vacant during that time. So it's hard to, we'll never align her percentages with my percentages because it's all dependent on the units that are vacant. Um, you could have a three bedroom versus a one bedroom, but it's going to cause more vacancy than, um, than that. Um, you'll see insurance proceeds coming in. You'll see insurance um, costs that aren't necessarily budgeted for, but you're going to show it's going it's to break the budget for the school. Um, and then there's um, 
that did it right up so that are happening. Uh, so we just want to see those collections to turn off the debt. Um, but we also charged the ledgers, which was also not happening. You know, in the beginning, they weren't charging these ledgers. To, and so if these people come back, it's good to pull up that individual and see, like, you know, they don't have a clean ledger. They, you know, we have issues. And that's what was happening. And we had a couple of instances when we first came on board. We found out they had already been here once before and had the same issue. <laughs> but nobody put it in. Nobody put it in. And it wasn't. It wasn't. It was so it looked like on our end that they left only nothing when they truly owed us the thousands. So. Yeah. And I don't know if this was discussed last time, but they, we are looking to increase the security deposit to a thousand dollars of twenty twenty four. Right now it's only five hundred, and so we're we're finding that's just sometimes not even the best thing. Yes. So one of my managers they do kind of a market survey of a lot of the local affordable and conventional units and that's still a thousand dollars is actually lower than what a lot of people are asking for right now so uh, it was 250 now it's i think we've got one up to 500. and are you guys changing your policy as well as you know, mm -hmm. not yet okay. not until some for not until goals. someone tells you yes yeah, so there's some horrible <laughs> because i i would just hate to allow them and then the damages just go even up Right now, we don't allow pets. It's just the emotional support animals and service animals. But if we just start allowing everybody to have pets with no and there's no pet deposit, no fee. Yeah. Which seems so we're going to stay right now with our no pets policy until legislation comes out with the okay. Then everybody will have a pet. So there's no pets unless it's a service animal. Um, except for Hearts Field Lodge, which has requires to go or uh, allows pets. Okay. So, on the suites, the accounts receivable was a negative. Yes, it was something I didn't catch during my review. <laughs> in September, because um, we had we had we had some new write-offs that counteracted my earnings for that whole year. So it's been updated in October. So then, is there more? So, so then, is the net income then higher for the suites then? Because you wrote off too much. Uh, no. So, so what this is is if this is already in there to begin with. So from usually at the end of the year, we always do. For the suites, it's always the highest, so it's like usually 10%. If it's over 90, it's 90%. And, and if there's met units, that's that, that was a hugest chunk. And uh, usually, we don't have to update these until annually, but it's, it's been fluctuation with the write offs. So, yes, it will uh, kind of negate what occurred this month. <laughs> so the vouchers, sorry, this is for a quick little tiny. I'm trying to give you kind of an idea. This is what our two-year tool is, um, and and what it looks like as we go through the years. Um, technically, at the end of this year, we're going to be at about 418 vouchers. Is what we're looking at. But by the end of next year, we're going to have to decrease to 379 vouchers. The way it's looking, and the reason that is. is they increased. The 2024 increase for the fair market rents was actually pretty significant. It's almost like two hundred dollars a unit. You add that up, 12, 12 months, depending on when you certify, it's gonna so we've been kind of aggressive on, on what we're gonna see in changes in rent increases as the months go along. Um, unless they get <laughs> and usually we won't know that until March of the following year, until March of 2024, we don't know if they're getting this additional money or if there's an opportunity for us to ask for additional money. If there's buckets of money available. Can you walk us through this a little bit? Like, what is the UMAs? What's the actual UMAs? Yeah, 
Yeah, so um, the UMA is an actual, like, that's what we need to So we could have 500, 518 vouchers, but this is where we landed in that room. We have 410. Actually, we have 416. Um, then that's the actual happening. Then you'll come down to um, November and you'll have vouchers that are issued. So we have people out searching. And so what they do is they kind of take your attrition rate and how fast you're leasing item units up. And they take that and they kind of divide that into the next, uh, this, the next column after that door that says new leasing from issued vouchers. It's automatic calculation. And so I'm saying we're probably going to lose two of those here, two of those the next month based on our attrition rate. And then in the, the column in between that, I basically say, we need to reduce by. So I've already told the group, if you get five, that you know they, they either pour out and you never hear from them, or they, they lose it because of fraud, or they just lose their voucher because they don't qualify anymore. Uh, we need to cut five out so that we keep it in. So this is kind of the beginning we have to play every month to see where we're at. Yeah. And then, yeah. So then it'll kind of do an automatic calculation over here to kind of give you an idea of what your actual projected are. So those are kind of the next columns based on where you're at today, what they think you're going to lease up, what you need to lease down on, and then what your actual projected per month cost per unit is. And so then it'll kind of do this other little calculation in the yellow and say, as you go through these months, here's where we see your actual monthly amounts going to be, and it kind of does that calculation now. And so it does two years because you get so much money, and it actually kind of covers the two-year period with your reserves. But as you start to voucher up and, and the rent rents increase, you don't realize you have to voucher down. And it can go into a third year, but that's when it gets going. <laughs> yeah, I, it's 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 a struggle. I have I have let and, and, and we're doing one hundred and five percent right now of market time. So that's another thing that that has also dropped our value. You know, we were expecting to be at four hundred, but we had to drop just because we did the hundred plus. It's harder for them to find units at that rate. I don't I don't think it's harder in our area, but what we were doing was we were matching Boulder County and Boulder County was all going to be five. When Boulder County was over to ten, I was like, we can't. It's gonna we're gonna significantly reduce our vouchers. And for every voucher we reduce, we need to add them. So the lower your the voucher count, the lower your admin costs to support the program. Well, part of the challenge is about 50% of the county's vouchers are actually in Walmart. And Boulder. Uh, and, yeah. Both. So we have a lot of those folks coming into Walmart, which is pushing out our vouchers. It's a challenge. And so yesterday, when they were having a different conversation with the county rep, I did kind of, we got into housing. We're going to have to talk about that because. Um, it's really impacting our community, and so I'm going to um, probably next year engage in, in that conversation. It's a really, really bad deal that the housing authority got into about 20 days, or well, more than that, they had about 40 years ago. That says you don't port over if you're in Boulder County, and it's a, it's a problem. So those programs are continuing to grow. Well, ours are not, but we are we are serving everyone, and our voucher holders are trying to. It's a whole. It's a very very big win. The other thing we probably could also look at next year is looking at it by zip code because I think the county has theirs by zip code, so this zip code that's the fair market. Not just the general global fair market then. So we could get down to that because technically Walmart is cheaper than our super or this is than our super. So yeah. and it's oh, more affordable housing, it's always being built. Yeah. And 
our neighboring communities. Yeah, that's going to be the next conversation. Yeah. Actually, uh, more from the city side is regional housing partnership. Is about stop building here and build in the rest of the Lafayette Superior, uh, unincorporated Boulder County. You know, there's a lot of places they can build. They just don't want to fight with the nylons or the gun barrels. And you know, if you're gonna, this is my soapbox. If you're gonna talk about affordable housing. Then you need to build affordable housing. Don't just talk about it, and then when there's an opportunity, shy away from it. And so, um, yeah, I think that's a conversation with the council. That's probably going to be an interesting conversation. It's entwined in land use planning and there was one specific land use or entitlements process for permanently affordable housing within the Boulder County region of every. One agreed to and took the ability for NIMBYs to kill projects. The amount of public input they have in affordable housing is ridiculous. And it started in a, in a good place, but it's taken over. So it's rooted in racial segregation history, but it's now come full circle and now segregates both the water. And it's expanded, it's not even just affordable, it's market rate, it's density. So it's a problem that is moving up and always has been down there. Well, I mean, it's really interesting. I mean, housing generally, I sent an article that I was reading last night on CNN to Wallingford. You know, the challenge is, is that the housing prices is no longer just affordable and attainable, it's all housing. And this article did a really good job in, in really laying out the fact that if you're not moving into the city and you're not doing this, um, you're setting yourself up for a failure point. Um, and right now, you know, when we look at our housing data, um, and uh, Kyle, Snyder. Kyle Snyder sends me a report every year, every month, he sends off my report out. What's really interesting in the housing market right now is that prices aren't going down. They're actually month over last month over or the same month last year it went up. It's the days on the market that are extending out longer, which tells us pretty it's pretty clear that the minute the interest rates start dropping, we're likely to see competition again that just sends us on an out of control pricing once more and, and if we're not filling that gap with something affordable and attainable then we're just going to continue on the hamster wheel. Um, is there policy work from the city on the builder's risk mitigation that's we've talked been to talked C about? We've talked to CML about that and um, I think at the last legislative session um, or there was a legislative update in Denver and I think for the first time, there were more conversations from the legislators about really needing to dig into construction defects. And, and it wasn't limited to one party. I think everyone was starting to go, here's what we need to do. Um, and the work that we're doing with LEDP, they're engaging. Aaron's going to um, some of the folks in the state talk about getting us involved. Um, just because from a city standpoint, one of the few where we sit in and we have the ACI, we have the LHA, and we have our own affordable and now sustainable project that really can, can see the, the full picture and, uh, and talk about it. Because I think most people say, when, when builders bring it up, well, it's self-interest and it's, they can just start going through litany of what it's about, but what it's really about is the underwriters uh, in terms of what they're willing to do. It's about the insurance companies, and now it's about the construction companies. The construction companies and multifamily projects are coming in, and as part of their contract is, this will not be for sale. Mm -hmm. and, and so, um, 
will never build condos as long as that yep. is in place. And that's missing. Yep. That's a missing piece. Yep. But there's no there's no such thing as a starter home anymore. You see either you rent an apartment or you buy a single family. And that's a big thing. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, you know, we have our own retirement and our investment group, and we were talking about REITs and really looking at those that are probably more heavier in apartments because of the lack of housing nationwide. And um, I can tell you, talking to my colleagues, uh, it is now almost as bad in Texas where it wasn't that bad. Um, a lot in California, California's California, but it, it is every state. And construction's been shut down because of interest rates. We can't get financing. So the project wasn't already through and writing and ready to go. And you probably see this more than if it wasn't ready to go, they're not getting any financed to build new. So then we have another one that comes at us. So buckle up. So I just have a question. With the raising of the rents, are we seeing any people that are any residents that may have to move out because they're not going to be able to afford that? We've never had all the revenue because the price has increased. And I think Harold did a really good job of educating us that coffee and competition is required, but we've not had any pushback this year. And I think part of the challenge is where, what, what else did they do? Yeah. I mean, on the street. <clears throat> yeah. and so, um, and, and a lot of it comes in, yeah, but what else did they do? Mm -hmm. And for us, what else did we do? Because you have to pay your gas bills and your utility bills. Do you buy your insurance services? Uh -huh. <clears throat> Ours were about 40%. Public 
service now to check your insurance. <laughs> Camera debacle. We are ordering equipment, so a lot of different moving parts of this, but basically federal procurement, state procurement, all these things came into play. And um, long story short, we are bidding on the equipment at this point, and then moving forward with the city on the install from the company that we've all been going to, and he's been working with us for months. So there's a contract now moving forward with him with the city as well. Meth detector update. We Dan from New Zealand is here. We are meeting with him tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to talk to him about the data that we've been gathering since June. Uh, what we've seen, uh, questions we have for him. Harold and I met last week and had you know pretty much a few questions just set out to understand you know where they're going with technology and what we're seeing is an efficiency on our end. And then he's going to give us an update, like a new version, tomorrow when he's here. And we plan on putting that at um, AMSN and the vegetable, or the vegetable, vegetables, you know, um, basically where a lot of folks come in and out. Um, so that that will be where the new device is going to go. And um, so I'm pushing the our attorneys to hear it out and that's an end, and I plan on having that for you next month to just review and look at. Um, both of our attorneys have seen it. I've written some basically asked for changes, just knowing what the device is and how it's working and then putting all the legalese to that. So look forward to seeing that next month in our meeting. Yeah. And calls for service. Man, find some wood. We, you know, ebb and flow, but overall been very, you know, very low cost of service, as Lisa had mentioned, and um, really stand on top of um, any problems that come up. We're, we're basically putting all our resources to to those folks right away. I think I emailed you about a drywall alternative product. But like, you probably get a thousand emails a day. Can you tell me when you did? It was probably a few weeks ago. Okay. Um, I was gone for a slight period. So. Okay, sorry about that. Well, in our system, it's moving people. Oh, yeah. So, drywall? So, um, we are on Willoughby Corner. Our FF&E consultant is um, a company called DRB Interiors based out of um, upstate New York. And one of them was telling us about a product they recently put into office space that is a drywall alternative and it's recycled plastic so it's a sustainable blah 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 and I asked her for the specs on the project on the product because I would be interested to see if it if it's not as permeable as drywall how it would work in multifamily because that could be a huge I don't know how expensive it is comparatively, but it might be like how we view countertops. Sure. Better to put in a solid surface countertop and change it out less often up front than pay for for my cut and have to constantly be replacing it. So I'll get, um, I was out sick when they came, so I'll connect with her and see if she can get me the information or put me in contact with the manufacturer because I would love to get some samples and test it. Yeah, that'd be if that's a place, well, if that's something you guys can do, test. Sure. Exposure. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, my mind just went. <laughs> yes. I don't know if you have a method to yeah, do that, um, but we can talk about that. Yeah, that would be wonderful. That would be wonderful to look into. Yeah, and I'll look for your email. Okay, I'll okay. I'll I'll resend it. That's probably the easiest. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Because if that's something you that have to do, do, that'd be great. No, I'm good. Other business, anybody? It was 5.7%. It's not bad. 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 It's
Yeah, so, so, that's, yeah. that's, that's going to be a higher coverage later. That's not part of the equation. So, well, it's, it's yeah. kind of a mess because when you look at the case out of Denver where they they attach the liability to the property owners. Now, granted, this is more active use than not cooking, but that case really opened the door for liability for property owners. So, if you have a contaminated unit, you get in and get sick. And, they and then you don't have coverage. The, oh, the landlord not addressing it. Right. And so. You know that kind of that concerns me a lot because well this is more of a direct let's say cooking or high use it creates a gap in the liability for landlords and um, so we're gonna have to watch that so we have just a couple of minutes left is it going to address the rocks the what the rocks the landscaping is what you're going to do so we've got a rock at spring creek fall river Aspen Senior, Aspen Neighborhood, and Harrison Suites. So my priority was good in lot. It is not a high priority to move out yet, but we will work through the next couple months and you know, disperse where they need to go. Is so this like boulders or rock gravel instead of mulch? 22, gravel. yeah, 22 up to eight inch rock, depending okay. on the property and the location of where it's going. So landscape. So it's aesthetics. Do the cops want to scoop I've gotten some. We're right about three, four thousand for the month. So. Yeah, just. Let me know when you're ready and I'll pay for that. I don't want to take it. So, we got it. So we got them. <laughs> they're they're yes. large enough size. Yeah. We're going to try and do it with it. It's good to hear it. Oh, yeah. I think it's going to be a little bit of a I know. Yeah. <laughs>